All right, I am here with my friend, uh, Julie. Julie, thanks so much for being on Theology in the Raw for the first time. Great to be on the show. I've listened to it before, so it's fun to be on it. And, and last time we were talking, I think I was on your, your podcast, right? Or You were. Yeah. Yep. My podcast is Java with Julie. So I came and met you at one of your conferences to learn from you and also to record with you. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, you know, I've known your name for a long time. I mean, you've been in this space of intimacy and sexuality for a while. Uh, can you just tell us just briefly, like, what, what is it that you do? What's your nine to five job-ish thing, ministry, whatever? And, and you know, we're in the middle of the corona uh, <laughs> nightmare right now. So things might look differently now, but when the virus is not spreading, what, what, what does your life look like? Yeah. Um, it's different every day, probably like yours. Um, but travel speaking, but also a lot of just reading research on, uh, what's happening in the top in the field of sexuality and then just ministry. A lot of my focus over the last eight years or so has been ministering to women on topics of sexuality just integrating uh, theology. I'm also a clinical psychologist, so that piece of it with how do we handle the everyday issues that we're facing related to sexuality. So uh, so I love the variety of what I get to do from the face-to-face -face contact to the writing to me learning and just teaching others. Well, why don't we start there with female sexuality? Like, you know, I've, I've done a, a bit of research into this, but I'm a guy, right? So I'm, I'm yeah. it from a distance, but how, how would you let, uh, maybe just start like on a 30,000 foot level. What, what are some unique things about female sexuality? I know, I know that's a general statement, but yeah. um, to somebody, let's just say a guy out listening out there, you know, probably the majority of my audience is probably male, maybe 60%. Um, what are some things about female sexuality that you think that a lot of people maybe don't know or don't realize that, that might need to know? Yeah, well, I think just probably putting words to what most people already know uh, female sexuality is complicated. Uh, and one of the main ways it's complicated is because uh, one part connects to all the other parts. Um, so for example, where the average guy would identify, I have an issue with pornography, or I have an issue with lust, and they're able to compartmentalize that, even to the extent where it's a negative, where what I do on the computer has nothing to do with my marriage. Mm -hmm. A woman can't compartmentalize anything. And so uh, if she's saying, hey, I have problems in my sexuality, think about it like a huge plate of spaghetti. Everything touches everything else. So there's aspects of her body image that are involved, um, just her identity, uh, maybe trauma from the past that she hasn't worked through. Uh, and this might be the presenting problem might be, I just can't even enjoy sex with my husband. And as you dig deeper, there's all this stuff underneath that. And, uh, and so in some ways, uh, female sexuality, it, I would say is healthier because we're, we're more apt to connect all those spiritual, emotional pieces to what we're experiencing. But in other ways, it's so much more complicated because there's no quick problem solved. Just read this book and everything is good. It takes years of, of really pursuing growth in, in your relationship with the Lord and just healing in general. I've often heard, because I, you know, I deal primarily in the space of same-sex sexuality, that when it comes to female same-sex sexuality, it can become complicated because well, your, your spaghetti analogy is, I mean, super helpful because, the, you know, there's a difference between, say, um, emotional attraction, intimate attraction, romantic attraction, maybe even sexual attraction, whereas guys, it's kind of like, you know, I'm sexually attracted to this person, not that person. That's kind of the, you know, <laughs> the yeah, extent. yes. For, for, and I know, I'm, again, I'm using stereotypes, but for most guys, it's just, it, like you said, it's very easily to, to, to think through these different categories. But for women, I mean, could, is it possible for, for a female to be, say, sexually attracted to guys, but maybe romantically or even intimately or emotionally attracted to girls? And that could be really confusing, right? Especially for a, 16 year old or whatever who looks at another girl and has an emotional kind of spike and it's like oh am i yeah am i bisexual like what am <laughs> i you know um is that yes and no you're absolutely hitting on something big there which is why we're seeing sort of an explosion of gender fluidity uh, and sexual interest fluidity and in, and in women young women more than we are in young men because everything is combined and so very few women, I would say even older women, would say, I'm sexually attracted to men, but I feel more connected to women because it's all mixed together. We can't discern between 
what it is to be sexually attracted versus just feeling safe, feeling like that person knows me, I'm comfortable with them. Um, and so it's very easy for women of any age, but particularly younger women who don't really know who they are yet to say, because I feel closer to my best friend who is a female than I do to guys, I must be bisexual or I must be gay uh, or I need to think about my gender. I, mean, I would say pretty much any woman would say, yeah, there's definitely been seasons of my life, if not my whole life, where I feel closer emotionally to women than I do to men, even maybe yeah. my husband. Because, uh, because in general, guys just don't get girls. You know, they don't, yeah. they don't connect with women the same way women connect with women. And that, that intimacy can be easily understood as sexual, sexualized. Is that, because I mean, and this is purely anecdotal, <clears throat> but I feel like, it's anecdotal, but I don't think this is an overstatement. When I, when I speak to youth groups or, you know, junior high groups, high school groups, which I don't do a lot of, but, but periodically, I, I would say it's almost more likely that when I meet a teenage female, they come up and talk to me or whatever. I feel like the, the rate of pe girls who say they're bisexual is almost higher than those who say they're straight. Yes. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's, well, you know, maybe <laughs> it's, I'm talking about same sex sexuality. And, and so maybe those are the ones coming up to me, but it's like, um, is there an explosion in specifically teenage girls identifying as bisexual rather than even straight or lesbian? Is that, are we seeing a spike in that? Yeah, I think we, we have, again, it's more anecdotally and just little pieces of evidence that we see coming out with research, not just in terms of who they're attracted to, but also the explosion of gender fluidity and how they define themselves. Um, and the research has all shown that female sexuality is far more fluid than male sexuality. Right. And so there, I'm sure you've seen research that will show that uh, a lot of women who identify as gay or bisexual, by the time they reach like their mid twenties or early thirties, they'll have settled into, no, I'm pretty much heterosexual. That was just a time of experimentation. So, yeah. so it's a whole different animal when you're talking about female sexuality, whether it's, uh, it, whether it's gender and sexual attraction or just how do you figure out how to enjoy sex and how do you get past the things we've experienced, uh, maybe sexual trauma in the past and things like that. Uh, it's a far more complicated field in some ways, but like I said earlier, it's also good because women are more likely to make those connections than the average man will be. Well, I've, I've thought that as I think about like male sexuality and female sexuality, I'm like, male sexuality can, it kind of, is easy to cheapen sex. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. You know? With yep. women, it's like it's it's so much more holistic. It seems. Yep. Um, and layered and 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 integrated into your into the complexity of our of our, of our humanity in a sense. You know. And it I'm is like, kind of like how sex seems to be designed, not just this thing that's, you know. Um, yeah. I. Yeah, I, man. I have so many. So. Um, <clears throat> this is i guess on the topic but a little bit of a detour um pornography among women are we seeing mm -hmm. um well I, I mean i've read some studies and it seems like there is a is a higher rate um is that is that true and is is pornography for women different than how how men struggle with it or yeah i i'd say yes and no again just based on the research that we're seeing um, we see like an older generations, there's this traditional kind of stereotype that played out where very few women would uh, be drawn into pornography or addicted to pornography. They'd be more likely to be pulled into any form of pornography that has a storyline, which is why Fifty Shades of Grey just went crazy because it, it basically- women, right? I mean- Oh yeah. I mean, it's the fastest selling book in history. Oh my God. Uh, so uh, why did that happen? Because it was helping women connect uh, sexual desire, which a lot of women have trouble feeling, with a romantic storyline. And so a lot of women won't immediately get pulled into pornography unless there is an element of this is connecting me through fantasy with somebody or online sexual chat rooms. You know, they're more likely to want that kind of connection. But that's not always the case, and we're seeing that particularly with younger women who just uh, have a similar draw to pornography than as men have traditionally had, where it's just they see something exciting, stimulating, their brain starts 
reacting to that uh, with dopamine and other chemicals that just reinforce this is where I can find pleasure, this is where I can find escape. Um, but again, women are also more apt, as we talked about, to be able to identify, I'm looking at porn because I'm lonely. I'm looking at porn because I'm bored. Where you ask a man why he's looking at it, and he'll be like, I don't know, I just like it. Yeah. So, um, so women are more apt to tie it to what's happening emotionally with them. Gosh, that's, yeah, that's fast. So what I don't understand is with, I haven't read the book or watched the movie, probably won't, Fifty Shades of Grey. Although in, in my research, I do find myself having to, you know, pay attention to stuff that I normally wouldn't, just so I'm familiar with it. But yeah, I, I yeah, n- not much of an interest there, but um. But it isn't Fifty Shades of Grey? Doesn't it have some pretty abusive, like BDSM stuff? And what's the draw for women in that? Like, yeah. So it's not just like some romantic, you know, novel mm-hmm. or something, some steamy novel. It's like <laughs> yeah. it seems like it's, again, I'm, I'm not familiar, but it seems like really unhealthy. Like it, yes, on to this is that? Yeah, it's good. I, I actually did quite a bit of research on this when it first came out. Dan Gresh and I wrote a book called Pulling Back the Shades, and that oh, wow. book actually gets into why are women we reading Fifty Shades of Grey? Why are we drawn to it? And, uh, and absolutely, you've got the enticing sexuality, but it is mi- mixed with BDSM, uh, which is, uh, you know, bondage, sadism, masochism. I can't remember the last one. You, uh, you get it. Um, yeah. But, not, not but sure. yes, but basically uh, the storyline is that there's this young amazingly handsome man who's like in his late twenties and earning millions of dollars. Again, here we go with fantasy, but he also has abuse in his past. And one of the ways that he acts that out is he has a red room of pain and he has contracts with women that basically give him permission to engage sexually in some bondage activities. And so he and the main character fall in love and it's this tension of she really loves him. She's a virgin when she meets him. Uh, and he introduces her to all this uh, this bondage type sexuality, which in the novel and the series of novels turns out to be very romantic. Um, and again, this is fantasy. And one of the things we talk about in Fifty Shades or Pulling Back the Shades is we have to understand the difference between fiction and fantasy. Fiction is something that could conceivably happen. Fantasy is something that takes us out of the realm of the natural world, which, uh, which you know, like Star Wars, we're, we know we're entering a different galaxy. The rules are different. In sexual fantasy, we've got to realize that the author, without telling us, is taking us into a world where reality, this couldn't happen. So in reality, you can't fall in love with a man who has a red room of pain and is engaging in, uh, you know, bondage type things. and. Uh, and abiding by a contract where you have a safe word and this becomes a loving romantic relationship. Um, But we're pulled into it for a lot of reasons. You know, one of them, which is a theory, which I think has a lot of validity, validity, is we live in a society where men are very passive. And there's a part of a woman's heart that wants a man who's going to take charge uh, and who's going to say, okay, I'm making a decision. Uh, I'm stronger than you. I'm going to entice you with my strength, but somehow also protect you. Uh, And so I think even that element of this young man who is taking charge and even overdoing it Mm -hmm. taps into some of the desires of a woman's heart that we don't talk about very often in today's culture. So you think the backdrop of male passivity in this day and age might have nurtured the the sales of, of the book? I do. And it's not just me, like Barbara Walters, they were talking about this on The View when Fifty Shades of Grey was really big. And she said this, she said, let's just say when you go home, you want a man to be a man. Uh, and, and there are a lot of secular voices that are saying there's something very romantic about a man's strength and a man just taking charge. Um, yeah. But again, in our culture, you never hear that. It's, it's politically incorrect to even right? say it. Yeah. But, but yeah. It's yeah. funny because yeah, I, I, again, anecdotally, people I talk to, I, I, I'm married to my wife, we have four daughters, teenage daughters, and I'm, you know, in the work that I do, I'm around men and women equally, and, and uh, I, I would say that's probably true with the majority of women that I, that I talk to. Um, yeah, I mean, so my, my, my wife, who is incredibly 
capable. Like she literally just got done building an, a house in our backyard, an art studio. Like she's out yes. there with a, um, with my chop saw, hammer, nails, screw gun. She put in windows. She put in, I mean, she's, um, you know, I tell people it's almost, yeah, it, it, she's, she's a, a very capable, independent kind of woman. Yeah. You'd be the first one to say, I want a man who's going to be a man and, and, yeah, make the decision and take charge. And she, she can't stand male passivity, even mm -hmm. though she's, again, you would expect somebody who's, who's very kind of like um, capable and independent to maybe, you know, walk over men or whatever. She's like, no, I'm the first one to say, if I walk in the room, I would much rather have a man take charge. Um, but yeah, if he's not going to step up, I can do it. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think in some ways it takes a very confident, capable, secure woman to say that because she's not threatened by male power, she's actually inviting it. Yeah. Um, but but these, these dynamics are so messed up in our culture that we don't even know how to give voice to what we want. Um, and so I think Fifty Shades of Grey tapped into something that is curious, um, and we're not really sure why we're so drawn to it. I wonder how many people have bought the book while we're talking. I <laughs> 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 not, some people are like, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be drawn to this, but I need to read no. it. No, I, I, I would encourage you to read Pulling Back the Shades instead. <laughs> I, I read all three books um, 50, of Fifty Shades of Grey just so that I could write the book. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you read it. Uh, yeah. I actually was really worried about reading it and yeah. prayed a lot about it and actually read it on my knees just as a posture of prayer because I didn't want you know, there's just a lot of bad stuff in there. I didn't want it to take plant in my heart, in my mind. So I forget, was it a male or female author? Is it a male? Author? It was a female author from it England. Was a okay, mm -hmm. so that, wow. Yeah. That makes, okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, t uh, tell me about, so your latest book is Rethinking Sexuality, God's Design and Why It Matters. And you've used this phrase, um, uh, uh, sexual discipleship or what's the what's the phrase you use that, yes sexual discipleship yeah can you unpack that a little bit and, and i want to i want to tether this to the purity movement and where you see maybe some pros and cons with with that movement um, yeah absolutely um, yeah um so rethinking sexuality and really this idea of sexual discipleship came out of uh, the ministry that i've been doing with women really across the country on sexual issues and what I realized is that uh, even Christian women who do their Bible studies, are very engaged in church, uh, love the Lord, they really didn't know how to have a biblical response to sexual questions, whether it be something like, my husband's looking at pornography, I don't know how to respond, I have no sexual desire in marriage. I'm a single woman. I don't know what to do with my sexual desire. On and on. I, I, where was God when I was abused? Mm. All the questions that we get. And, uh, and it dawned on me that we don't know how to think biblically about our sexuality. At best, the church has taught us what to think about specific sexual issues, like don't have sex before marriage, uh, or male and female matter, you know, the kind of topics you're tackling. Mm. But they haven't taught us how to think about sexuality. Uh, they haven't given us a, a, a framework or a worldview that helps us understand why sex even matters. Whereas the culture has done a great job at that. Uh, everyone can answer any sexual question from the cultural perspective because they've discipled us in our sexuality. Uh, where at best the church has done maybe some education or you know, had sort of this problem solving approach of let's just create groups for people that are hurting. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but sexual discipleship is more this idea that sexuality isn't a problem we have to solve. It's a territory we have to reclaim. We have to reclaim the narrative. And, uh, and very few, if, if like any Christians could tell you, what is the narrative of why our sexuality matters from a biblical perspective? Um, and so it's, it's really an all of life call to maturity in our understanding of biblical sexuality and how we apply that in our own lives as well as how we minister to others. You, you mentioned, this is so good. Um, how, how, how would you unpack, uh, and I'm sure you do this in the book, but um, yeah, I guess well, let's talk about that biblical narrative. What, what is yeah. the, the, the two minute pitch of what is God's design for sexuality? What's the purpose of, of sex? Is it just for yeah. pleasure? Is it just 
you know, is it for procreation, all the above, mm -hmm. or whatever? Like, how would you, yeah, articulate? Yeah, uh, yeah if, you, if you don't mind, if I can set this up a little bit just by talking about two other narratives sure. that I think are good to contrast it with. Um, because we all are walking around with a narrative about our sexuality and most of us aren't even conscious of it. Um, so the predominant narrative in our world is a cultural narrative that's based on humanism. And it says that sexuality matters because it's a key part of our identity. And if you want to be a whole self-actualized person, you need to experiment and look inward to find out what is going to make you happy sexually. Uh, you can't be a whole mature person unless you do that which is why in our culture it's considered unloving and even immoral to get in the way of somebody's sexual experimentation. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the narrative that most of us are swimming in. And it's why when we open the Bible, it doesn't make sense yeah. that God would say, don't do this or save sex until marriage. How are you going to experiment if you follow those rules? Can, can I, can I uh, yeah, dig into that a little bit? Because so every now and then I get this question at conferences that I do. The question is typically framed like this. Since we know from science that we, we like it's unhealthy to suppress our sexuality, that we kind of need sexual expression to flourish. Therefore, yeah. isn't it inhuman to call, you know, call somebody to celibacy or whatever to repress their sexuality? Now, there's so many assumptions built in. Is, is there, are there some studies from science, whatever, which doesn't bother me at all because there's, yeah, that just, Science is so politically driven that it all, you know you have to read a thousand studies before you get your arms around it. But is there that is there a movement within the science the uh, scientific study of sexuality that says it's 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 actually unhealthy for a human to repress their sexuality? And would, as a psychologist, what would you say? About yeah, that? I would say that there's a narrative of that, uh, but there is very little research that would back that up. Now, certainly, you can look at um, conservative families or environments that don't handle um, sexual dysfunction or sin or desires well. And we'll talk about the second narrative in a minute that kind of, I think, identifies that. And certainly you can point to research that says, okay, if a, if a kid is experiencing same-sex desire and we put them through, right. uh, you know, this really repressive kind of situation and people reject them, they're at higher risk for depression and suicide. But Preston, actually, uh, what's interesting is the scientific research is more compelling to say that when we give people sexual freedom, they're more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and suicide. Like there's a ton of research coming out that is saying the more, particularly for women, and again, I study women, the more sexual partners a woman has in her lifetime, the more likely she is to experience depression, low self-esteem, shame, you know, all these things that actually don't even go away if she gets into a, a committed married relationship. Yeah, Mark uh, McNair. Mark McNair. Uh, Mark, yeah, Jeremy. Sex, I think deals with yep, that extensively. Yep, Premarital Sex in America. He did another book like that, the book Hooked. Uh, but, but it's just, they're gathering research that are showing from the scientific perspective that actually the research goes against the cultural narrative. But we value our freedom so much that, we don't want to hear that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So you did cult, the cultural narrative, and yeah. Yeah. The other lenses? Yeah. The second narrative is what many of us probably grew up with, which is the purity narrative. And the purity narrative certainly is within evangelical Christianity, but also we find it in Mormonism and Catholicism. But it essentially says that uh, your sexuality is important because it's this moral category, and if you want to please God you will not only save sex for marriage, but you will not be sexual until you get married. Um, huh. You shouldn't have sexual thoughts, desires, longings. Those are bad. Uh, and uh, if you can manage to not be sexual uh, during your teen years and early adult years, God will bring this wonderful spouse for you and you'll automatically have this shame-free, wonderful sexual pleasure. Uh, but if you do mess up, um, you know, depending on your religious background, we'll say, well, you have a second chance, there's a second virginity, but you're kind of always on plan B. And so there's a lot of shame around that. And I would say that we underestimate uh, the power of that purity narrative and all of our teaching in the church around sexuality. We don't, we don't realize that that is 
that is a stream that is fighting it against the cultural narrative. And most people feel like they have, they have to choose one or the other. And if I choose the purity narrative, what about my friends that have been sexually abused? Like, where do they fit? And how about my friends that are LGBTQ? Like, the purity narrative doesn't even address those issues. Um, how far can I go in a dating relationship without breaking the rules? And it's really a very legalistic, almost prosperity gospel view of God, where if you follow the rules, God's going to give you happiness. And if you don't, you're kind of always under the shame. Uh, and I meet with women who are in their 50s or 60s who are still experiencing like guilt and shame because they slept with somebody in their teen years. Uh, even though they, they've been in the church, they'd say, I feel forgiven, but they'd also say, I've never been able to experience sexual pleasure with my husband because I never felt like I deserved it because I messed up. Wow. Wow. Um, you, I mean, you were around during the purity culture when, yes. when it was happening. You know, it's funny. I, I grew up, that was when I was, I was nurtured in, mm -hmm. in the late nineties, early two thousands, but I never even was like aware of it. I didn't really realize the what the purity culture was until afterwards. Maybe that's true for most people, but were you, have you, were you like an advocate of it when it was in the nineties or where were you when it was happening? I'm curious. Oh yeah, I was, yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was, just, I got married in 94 and, um, and I was very much a product of that early kind of purity narrative. And my story actually flows very consistently with a lot of women that I meet where I was raised in a Christian home, you know, the good Christian girl, didn't have sex until marriage. And uh, you know, I share about this a lot through our resources, but sex in my marriage was just horrible for the first 15 years. Uh, a lot of pain during sex. And part of that purity narrative was just, I carried that on with, well, I guess this is just something I have to grin and bear. And it's for my husband's pleasure. And if I'm a dutiful wife, I need to meet his needs, even if it's painful for me. And I'm a clinical psychologist at this point, you know, counseling couples. And, but this is, this was all that was out there from a Christian perspective. Uh, and there's no help. There's no, you know, you get together with other wives and a lot of wives are that way. Yeah. You just kind of have to do it because it's your duty. Um, and, and so just even the work that God has called me to has done a lot of healing in my life and my marriage. I had no idea first of all, how much I believe that purity narrative, and second of all, how destructive it was even in my own life and certainly in the women that I minister to. Wow. Okay, so the third, the third uh, narrative. The yeah. Discipleship. So you have to feel the tension of those first two, I think, to yeah. appreciate the third. But the third is really based on this idea that sex matters the reason it's so important is because it's a physical way that God has given us to understand an aspect of his love, his covenant love, uh, that God loves us passionately. He loves us based on his faithfulness and his promise. Uh, and he loves us jealously. And all of that is written into our bodies and our sexuality. Um, now, there, there have been some people, you know, Christopher West, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, great, great writer. He just came out with a book called Our Bodies Tell God's Story uh, that's based on uh, Pope John Paul's teaching, the theology of the body. Uh, but I think what he stumbled on here is really key, uh, and it's, it's central to understand the biblical narrative of sexuality, that sex is so sacred and so important and actually so part of who we are because it's the physical way that we understand the draw to and the celebration of covenant love. Wow. Um, so one way to put it is that the gospel is actually written within our sexuality. Um, and people don't, don't know this narrative, first of all, because it, it's like the first time you hear it, you're like, what did she just say? Like, I got to unwrap that. And it's, it's hard, it's complicated, but if you look all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you will see that most often sex is used as a metaphor of God's pursuit, his covenant love with his people, his call for them to faithfully and passionately love him. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament and New Testament, even in the language, uh, the word that's used for sex in the Old Testament, the word yada, 
is the same word that's that's used to describe intimate knowledge of God. Um, so, uh, so this is like something that I've been studying for really the last five or six years and uh, understanding more and more and more and how it changes the way you view everything related to sexuality when you get this. Hmm. Uh, but part of that narrative is also understanding because sex is so powerful and so holy, it's constantly under satanic attack. Hmm. Uh, and so all of us, I believe, have sexual brokenness. You know, it doesn't matter what your story is. This beautiful metaphor that's written in our bodies has been distorted at some level in some ways for all of us. It's not just the people that are addicted to pornography or that, you know, identify as LGBTQ. You know, the purity narrative says some of us are broken and some of us are whole. Mm -hmm. The biblical narrative says all of us are broken and all of us need God to, to bring truth and redemption and healing into our sexuality. Mm -hmm. There's that famous quote, I think it's wrongly attributed to Chesterton, that every yes. man who rings the bell of a brothel is searching for God. I don't know. That yes. it's, it's not Chester. I did some research. No, you're right. Same. Yeah, I did the same. And, it, and somebody else actually said it, but he gets the credit. And I can't remember the guy who originally said it either. But is that, is that, does that kind of summarize a lot of what West is, is doing, Christopher West, and, and that kind of connecting our sexuality really explicitly to our relationship yeah. with God and our longing for God. and Yeah, I would say um, that's the, the highest level view, but there's so much more to it um, that even within our bodies, and this has been really fun for me to research as a psychologist, even with our, within our bodies, there's evidence of our, our physicality, you know, like our anatomy mirroring Christ in the church mm. sexually. You know, like, for example, you think about the male anatomy and sexuality initiates and penetrates the female anatomy responds and receives. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, a seed is planted, which gives life. And that's the same thing that happens with Christ in the church. You know, he initiates uh, and we respond and receive the positive of the Holy Spirit. And out of that abiding comes fruit and, and reproduction. And so that's just one element of it, but there's so much to this, um, Preston, that yes, it includes our longings. Our sexual longings are really rooted in a more significant longing, but the breakdown of why gender matters, uh, why covenant matters, uh, why just sleeping around ultimately isn't going to get you what you want is because this design is written in every cell of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, when I, when I teach about marriage and, and uh, same sex sexuality and stuff, I always go back to cre creation and Genesis mm -hmm. one and two. And it's fascinating that, um, you know, God created us male and female. And then he says in his image, he created us or God, God created us in his image in the image of God. He created us male and female. He created us. There's just in interplay between bearing God's image and our male and female-ness, our, mm -hmm. our biological sex is somehow significantly connected to bearing God's, God's image. And then in Genesis 2, you know, it all comes together in this one flesh union. But what you have, what I try to point out is you have this in, interweaving of themes of creation, God yeah. bearing his image, sex, sexed embodiment, even mm -hmm. the marriage covenant coming together of it they're all woven together in the creation narrative so that one of the, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, people say, well, you know, they ask me, why is same sex relationships? Well, why did God say no to that? And I guess part of, part of my response at least is um, because the, the, the unity within difference is woven into the fabric of creation so that you are living in line with the flow of creation or, you know, as, as, Harawa says, with the grain of the universe, um, mm -hmm. which is a very kind of stoic way of, of talking about it. But that, that, that living in line with the created order is um, intrins an intrinsic good, if you will. Like that is a good within itself to, to be living in line with creation. And th those are categories we just don't... <laughs> <laughs> no, we just don't really have today. But I mean, ancient philosophers had had them. Yeah. That was a big thing. Like, how can we how can we live with the grain of the universe? Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I, what you're saying resonate with. I, I mean, you're putting it in ways that I, I haven't expressed in my own mind. But it's 
very much resonates with, with what I see as well. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot harder to teach than just safe sex until marriage. Yeah. But, um, you know, the way that I, way that I talk about it is if you're, you're a parent, so am I, you know, when our kids hit about three, they constantly ask the question why, and they never stop asking the question why, even when they get older. And if you're a lazy parent, you just keep saying, because I said so, yeah. but you're never giving a reason. You're never growing and maturing. And I think traditionally the church has always answered the question why around sex with, because the Bible says so. Like, here's the verse. It says this. Let's argue about that verse instead of answering the why. And the why is critical for us to grow and develop and to understand God's heart and also to get past asking the question, is this like, just we only talk about sexual morality in the church. We need to talk about sexual maturity, that all of us are called on this journey of groaning towards, with the help of the Holy Spirit, what, what sex was intended to be and what it was ex intended to teach us about the nature of God. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of work to do that the pain in our culture is bringing up. Um, but when we get too focused on one problem or one issue, we miss this larger picture that God is calling us all to, whether you're single or married, regardless of what your past is, regardless of what your struggles might be. Hmm. There's one of my favorite books. Oh, there it is. Um, John, Jonathan Grant, uh, Divine Sex. Have you, read, have you read that one? I haven't. I'll have to get that one. So, this one? Okay, it looks good. He's... Um, a compelling, a compelling vision for Christian relationships in a hypersexualized age. It's one of the best. I, I, in fact, as you're talking, I'm like, I want to go back and read this again. It's been probably three years. Um, he's a pastor, I think, in um, New Zealand. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but super. It's just, it's it, it's, it captures a lot of what you're talking about. Just this Christian vision for what sex is for, rather than kind of like purity culture stuff or the cultural stuff. Um, yeah, it's super. Yeah, super helpful. I, I there's such a need in the church for people to <laughs> understand this, right? I mean, when when you're sharing your message, do you find people resonating, or are they kind of like, man, I don't even really know what categories you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, it's been it's been really exciting. You know, I've had five or six years to try to learn how to communicate this in a way that people can understand, mm -hmm. um, and find metaphors, analogies, stories. And it's been really exciting that it's just giving people a totally different way of thinking. And, uh, and it's changing how they view uh, all the issues around sexuality, including their own struggles, uh, including their own woundedness. It gives them a framework to it, even how do I interact with my neighbor who disagrees with me on all these topics. So it's been really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to show to show them that, you know, at the end of the day, all of ministry is bringing people to Jesus, uh, yeah. regardless of what the topic that we start with. It's how do we how do we bring people to God, to the heart of God? Yeah. And I, I think sex has been used to keep people from God. And the most exciting thing is to see them actually pursue God, because now they're beginning to see his heart um, for this this topic that for many of them has represented so much pain. That's great. Um... I want to, I have a couple more questions. Um, I, I want to talk about abuse. You've mentioned abuse a sure. few times. I want to talk yeah. about that. But before I, so when people say, what is the purpose of sex? I typically give kind of a threefold response, um, pleasure, unity, and procreation. Or sometimes I think pleasure is kind of what drives us toward unity or, or, or communion or a bonding maybe would be, um, and procreation. How, how would you, and that, that's, you know, yeah. different ways of framing it. How would you respond to that? If someone says, well, what's the purpose of sex? Why do well, you, you know, I think first of all, it's like, what's the purpose of having sex or of being sexual? And that there's a big difference because if we're just talking about like pleasure, bonding and procreation, well, what does that say to the single Christian yeah. who is still a sexual person? And so we've got to understand that uh, our sexuality is God's way of reminding us that we were not created to do life alone. Um, it, and sexual desire draws us, as you mentioned, like to pursue a relationship. Like being in a committed relationship requires a lot of sacrifice. What could possibly drive us 
toward wanting to sacrifice like that. Well, sexual desires are pretty compelling force. And I'm not just saying the desire to have sex, but sexual desire is I want to share my life with somebody. I want to share my body with somebody. I want to be fully known. Uh, and so our sexuality is that that larger drive, mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, the purpose is to is to make us pursue relationship both here on earth and metaphorically to pursue intimacy with God. So real um, quick, so with with a, with a single person, would you say? And I've heard Wes, Wesley Hill talk about this. That that I think he I don't know what the words in his mouth, but I think he has said you know he's, he's a celibate Christian who's gay. Um, that his sexuality dri drives him to even non-erotic intimacy. Yes, like yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so sexuality is not just about having sex with somebody. Uh, if, you, if you look at, for example, what happens when we're sexually awakened at, at, in adolescence, we're no longer content just to be with our families. It's like you have a, a, a drive to pursue intimacy relationship. And for, for girls, it's I want to make friends. I want to share my secrets with them. It's the romantic longings that they may have. Men may experience it more in their bodies um, just because that's how they're wired. But because of sexual drive, a man's going to put down, a boy's going to put down the Xbox controller and say, there's got to be more to life than this. Like, I need a relationship. Um, and so absolutely, uh, the the fullness of that expression here on earth is marriage and sexual intimacy, but there are other expressions of it here on earth, including as a woman, part of my sexuality is I, I have a desire to nurture, uh, whether that's my own children or nurture within the family of God. I have a desire to be a mother at some level, whether that's spiritually or physically, that's part of being sexual. Uh, I have a part, I have a drive to share intimately with my friends. That's not sexualized, uh, but it's part of my sexuality. And so I, I think one of the reasons we get confused is because we're only defining our sexuality as having sex yeah. uh, instead of, you know, in some ways, like, I don't want to freak people out by this, but when you look at David's intimacy with the Lord, how he danced before the Lord with all of his might, you know, there's a sense to which it wasn't sexual, but that's, that's the deepest emotion and affection that, that he ever felt was towards the living God. Uh, and so if sex is a metaphor, there's no sex or marriage in heaven. It's a metaphor that's supposed to prepare us for the ultimate wedding ceremony, wow. uh, the ultimate union. And so, uh, you know, that's, again, a lot to chew on, but we, ca we can't have informed conversations about sexuality unless we define it as broader than just the purpose of having sex. Well, th th and this is something, again, a lot of my celibate gay friends have helped me understand or, you know, tried to help me understand. I, you know, I'm still trying to get my mind around it. But the, when we re when they would say, you know, when, when you reduce even same sex sexuality to just yeah. a desire to have sex with somebody of the same sex, that it cheapens and minimizes the holistic nature of our experience. And even, and this is where some Christians, same sex attracted Christians have gotten, or are I think misunderstood or just not understood by some more straight conservatives when they say there, there are aspects of my same sex sexuality that are good or say drive me to good things. So like mm -hmm. my, you know, like even Wes Hill and others would say, my need for non-erotic same-sex, non-erotic same-sex intimacy, hanging out with other guys in a very intimate, deep way that's not sexual is still shaped by um, my same-sex sexuality because my same-sex sexuality isn't just about having sex. Like right. uh, there's a few, there's several <laughs> minutes throughout the week when, yeah, that's what I, you know, it flares up and I, but I am always hundred, you know, twenty four seven. My my same sex sexuality is part of who I am. Would you? So is that kind of what you? I mean, would you? Yeah, I would say it's not even the same sex sexuality. It's just fact that we're sexual people. Okay. And so I would say even within marriage, a heterosexual marriage, sex is very much cheapened in most Christian marriages, because it's it's measured by how often did we do it? Are we compatible? Was it good sex? Yeah. It's not measured by is God using our longings and even our, the obstacles, the things we fight about sexually uh, 
to draw us into deeper intimacy, being known. And so like when I speak to married couples, I'll talk about the difference between being sexually active together and being sexually intimate. And I can't tell you how many people will come up and say, we've been married for like 30 years and I don't think we've ever experienced sexual intimacy because we've reduced sex and sexuality to the act instead of understanding the underlying purpose behind the act. Which is, which is due both to the cultural narrative and the purity culture. Exactly, the yes. Culture adopts the cultural narrative. It just adds a footnote, wait until you're married. But it, kind yes. of, it takes on a lot of the underlying assumptions about what sex is. In a sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we do a disservice to gay Christians, to single Christians by saying, you have to practice self-denial. But when you get married, like self-denial goes out the window. You can have as much sex as you want as long as it's with your spouse. Whereas a lot of sex that Christian married couples are having really is just about lust. It's not at all putting our desires under the Lordship of Christ, having it tempered by what it is to love each other, uh, to give to each other. And so, in a, in really a, a healthy, mature biblical marriage, sex within marriage requires the same amount of self-denial as it does actually with a single person. Yeah. All right. Let's, the last topic I want to talk about is, 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 is abuse. Um, yes. Why don't we start with what percentage of people have been abused, male, male and female? Yeah. And then I would love for you just put your uh, psychologist hat on and just speak to our audience who have experienced sexual abuse and, and what kind of counsel can you, can you give them? Yeah. Um, well, we don't have, we don't have accurate numbers on this because we can only go by self-report. Um, but based on the self-reporting numbers we get, most people would estimate that um, one in three women have been sexually abused wow. and one in about five or six men have been sexually abused, which is far more people than I think most of us assume. And I think that those rates are going to continue to go up in the younger generations, even though we have more conversation about it. We also are raising generations that are, are, are basically giving young people freedom to have whatever they want sexually. And uh, there's fewer boundaries. And, and so I, it's always been a huge problem. It's going to continue to be a huge problem. Uh, for those who have experienced sexual trauma, you know, I, I think the first thing that I just want to say is that I am so sorry uh, because we talk about sexual abuse in terms of the Me Too movement or the numbers of people or percentage of people, but having walked with people who have been uh, sexually traumatized, there are just no words uh, to describe the impact of that. And how for many of you, it just cascades into years of shame and of hiding and of questions. And, and, and I think it, that's very true for anyone who's been sexually traumatized. But I think even particularly for men more because we, we are less likely to acknowledge it or talk about it for men. It's, mm -hmm. it's assumed to be a woman's issue. Um, right. So the levels of shame and damage that are done in sexual abuse. Like um, you're probably familiar with Dr. Dan Allender, yeah. who has done so much research on this. And he says that the return on investment for evil is greater with sexual abuse than anything else in the world. In other words, if the devil wants to de destroy something with the least amount of effort, he'll use sexual abuse. Yeah. Because in the span of 30 seconds, a person's life and just understanding of safety and even a trust in their own bodies is undone. And that can, uh, that can yield this, the impact for years to come. And so um, I also want to say in light of that, that with, with Dan's work and so many other people's work, healing is possible and redemption is possible. And so don't hear me say this, like it's a life sentence. You know, I, I truly believe that God can redeem anything. Nothing is too great for him to heal. And I've known women who have been uh, sexually abused since the time they were babies and trafficked. And I've gotten to see um, the Lord's healing power in their lives. Babies? That's, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I, yeah. Um, I, I, that's not part of my story nor my wife's story or, um, 
I've got several friends that that's part of their story. And so it's, it's, it's a journey for me to even wrap my mind around that. I mean, I, I don't have a category for what it is to even experience it, l- let alone be on the perpetrator side. Like I just don't, mm-hmm. even that, that's a whole nother conversation. Like what would it drive is. somebody to do, to violate somebody in that way? Is, is it true that like those who have been hurt, end up hurting like like most people yeah. who are abusers have been abused is that is yes that and what's the psychology behind that I mean uh well there's lots of it and you know I think first of all uh your sexuality has been awakened at a young age mm-hmm. um we actually have on our job with Julie show a few months ago I interviewed somebody who was a sex offender and he describes in detail like how he was abused as a child he didn't know what to do with those feelings and thoughts and he, his sexuality is awakened and so as a teenager he starts acting out on younger boys and then the shame cycle continues like he can't tell anyone he can't get help you know he actually spent 6 years in prison um uh, but but yeah very much a case and not just typical of what we think about like that kind of story but also a lot of the women that I've worked with that have pretty severe sexual trauma at some point in their healing will say, I've acted out on other people, like um, as a teenager, as a young adult, and they have to deal with just how do I carry that shame? Um, and so uh, it just, it's, it's profound, but I would say, uh, you know, I don't know the research to it, but I would say a, a very, very high percentage, if not all sex offenders were once themselves the victims, okay. which I think is important to give us empathy that when you're talking about a sex offender, you're also probably talking about a man or a woman who themselves have been pretty traumatically victimized. So you're saying sex offenders, we obviously we always think of just a man and it, I'm sure it's a much, much higher percentage. Are you saying though, that there are women who have been abused, yeah. who end up abusing yeah. others? Yeah. And part, part of the reason we always say a man is because we define sexual abuse as um, a rape or, uh, you know, incest or things that involve penetration. But uh, most experts in the field will very much more broadly identify sexual abuse as being sexualized in some way by somebody older with authority uh, in a coercive way. So a female might sexually abuse somebody, a child or an adolescent uh, by being more enticing, by making comments, uh, by touching. uh, Whereas we might not automatically say that sexual abuse, it is sexual abuse. And so it's more subtle. It's awakening somebody else's sexuality. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so what's, uh, how to well i guess you kind of addressed it but i mean how, how did somebody heal from that i mean that that the profound shame and just the how that affects your sexuality is it if somebody has been a victim of abuse is, are they likely to carry that with them i mean for their life like to not really fully move beyond that or yeah well you know first of all i'm going to say that all of us have baggage that we we deal with um and so i don't want the person who's been sexually abused to like to add on and say well you'll never be whole you know as i said earlier we all have brokenness even from the purity narrative that we work through um but if you have been sexually abused i think you need to recognize that uh there needs to be spiritual healing as well as emotional or psychological healing uh, that we understand more and more about the impact of sexual trauma on the body, like even body memories, flashbacks. For a lot of for a lot of people, they really don't remember their sexual abuse or start to deal with it until they hit like the 30s or 40s. Um, sometimes it's when your own children reach the age that you were when you were abused. It's like the flashbacks are more powerful. There's more of this urge to walk through those memories now. And there's a real need to do that. Um, and so I would encourage you to find a Christian counselor who is trauma-informed, who understands what it is to heal from trauma, but also to recognize that this is, uh, you know, sexuality is a spiritual battleground and Satan plants lies in our hearts um, during episodes like sexual abuse. And a lot of the work is actually recognizing those lies, like the lie that I'll never be whole again, uh, I'm always gonna be dirty, a man will only love me if I give him sex, like those kind of lies. That's part of your healing too, of really pursuing 
the truth of who Jesus is and him speaking truth into those places. Julie, this has been so incredibly helpful. Um, again, your book is Rethinking Sexuality, God's Design and Why It Matters. I would highly encourage people to, to check it out. I'm just, I'm, I have it here in front of me and I'm skimming the, the pages and the table of contents and it's just, yeah, uh, it unpacks, I think, a lot of what we've been talking about. So thanks so much for what you do. Um, there's not a lot of us in, in this field, so it's, no. I feel just kind of a camaraderie. You know, it's good yes. that somebody else, uh -huh. else is dealing in similar areas. So thanks so much for the work that you do, for your writing, your speaking, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Well, you too. I'm, I'm praying for you and cheering for you um, because uh, the workers are few and the harvest is great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank thanks you. Thanks for being on the show. Take care. All right.